Good morning. We are so excited today to celebrate the class of 2016 from St. Mark's. A week or so ago, we had what we call our Blessing of the Graduates Dinner. And at that time, the graduates, their parents, y'all, you guys can sit down, I'm sorry. At that time, their parents, grandparents, and siblings were invited to come and celebrate this special time with them. And the parents were asked to deliver a blessing to their child. And it was a very special time. But we didn't want you guys to miss out on the celebration. So the first thing I want to do is show you guys sort of a prayer that we hope each of you will pray for these graduates. all come to the stage now please and we have one more very short video to show you um, I've had the pleasure and honor of watching these guys grow up in this church and we want you guys to see a little bit of what their life was like growing up at St. Mark's I can see it in your eyes that you are restless The time has come for you to leave It's so hard to let you go But in this life I know you have to be Who you were made to be As you step out on the road I'll say a prayer so that in my heart, you always will be there This is not goodbye I know we'll meet again So let your life begin Cause this is not goodbye It's just I love you to take with you Until you're
This year, we have 17 graduates that we're honoring here at St. Mark, and we did allow them to choose the service of their choice. Um, but if you look in your bulletin in the insert, there is a listing of all those, and we celebrate with each one of them. The church has a small gift for those who are here today. Caroline Carver. You guys have to come to me. Hunter Deloach. Blake Lindler. And Brock Wilson. Join me in congratulating the class of 2016. There you go. As we get ready to move into our sermon time, before we do that, we want to recognize our veterans uh, who have served. And ultimately, on Memorial Day, we recognize those who gave the ultimate price, who died while serving our, our country so that you and I can have the freedoms that we have today. So if you are a veteran, would you please stand? <laughs> the, um, Phil Lucas served in the Marines. Um, he came to us and wanted to, and I'm grateful, having had family who has served and some family that will be serving in our military, uh, for him to acknowledge and to help us remember them today. You're on. Thank, Thank you. you. 240 years ago, the founding fathers sat down and said, we've been subjects of the British government long enough. Their tyranny is intolerable. Enough. So a group of geniuses, and they were genius, set out to form a new nation. And in the formation of that nation, it was a radical concept for their time. Self-government. No monarchy, no kings, no queens, no ruling class. A country ruled from the people up to the government. They established a nation which would have a government, not the other way around. Since that fateful Declaration of Independence was signed, the signers knew what the consequences of their actions would be. They would have to take on and defeat the largest, most powerful army on the planet, the British Empire. They knew that the cost would be high. But since that day in 1776, no matter how high the price has been, America has been willing to pay the price of freedom. The other thing the Founding Fathers established was the inexorable link between our God and our country. As Jesus went to the cross to pay our sin debt, our military men and women have gone into battle to pay our freedom debt. I challenge each of you here today, and especially these graduates, because what most people don't realize is that when war comes, the young generation, the 18, 19, 20-year-olds, bear the brunt of the combat. I spent two years in Vietnam with the Marine Corps, and I think the oldest person I ever knew who was killed in action was about 23 years old. We're thankful that in the 240 years since this country was founded, we have had generation after generation willing to answer the call, whether it was in the World Wars, Korea, Vietnam, or the War on Terror. Each generation has within it the young men and the young women who will go into harm's way, who will put their lives, their very existence on the line. And many of them won't return. But again, the price of liberty and the price of freedom is high. But Americans have always been willing to pay that. I'll leave you with this scripture, John 15, 13. No greater love as a man or a woman than they lay down their life with their friends. Thank you. This morning we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 8. 
I'm going to look at this. Man, I got so much time. I stood up at, at 9.35 at the first worship <laughs> this morning. So I feel like I have an eternity to speak to you. We're going to first play a game of let's make a deal. It is audience participation. Okay? So I don't want to have to beg for your participation. I want you to partake. How many of you have ever seen the game show Let's Make a Deal? Uh, the teenagers, they don't know. Okay, here, it's going to be real easy. In envelope, I have cash. You can take the cash. Y'all are getting lots of cash right now, right? Are you hoping to? Okay. You can take the cash, or you can take what's in the box. You don't know what's in the box. It could be air. It could be a car. It could be the vacation of a lifetime. My wife is going, can I have Hawaii, please? Or in the game show, it could be a zonk. How many of you want the cash? Raise your hands. Lots of cash. How many of you want the box? Oh, I have a few brave souls. That's good. It's interesting. The children of Israel found themselves in a spot of whether they were going to choose what everybody else had or whether they were going to choose to continue or to follow God. Let me ask you, let's play this game a different way. Instead of the game show host offering you the choice, let's put me as the person. I've got cash. I've still got cash. You can take the cash, something you can see, you know what it is. It's a couple hundred dollars I stole from Hannah. You didn't even know I took your money, did you? Or you can take my box, and I'm telling you there's something good in the box. So, who wants the cash? Teenagers still raising their hands, I don't blame you. Who's taking the box? Oh, actually, a few people are going to trust Pastor John. Interesting. <laughs> the children of Israel, y'all don't know how much I like to play a good joke. The children of Israel find themselves in the same spot. Everybody else had a king. Every nation they faced had a king. They led them into battle. They were there in good times and bad but they could identify a king. The Israelites had a judge. They had a man of God. They had Samuel, chosen by God to lead the children of Israel. We find them, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, making a choice. I believe God's word will be on your screen or in your Bibles. It's 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. It said, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah. And they served in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. And they turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. I'm going to stop right there just for a second. The interesting thing is if we look at Samuel coming on to the scene, Eli was his master, was his teacher. Samuel comes and, and is appointed as the judge for the same reason that the men of Israel will come to Samuel. Eli's sons did not follow the ways of God. God said, I can't have that. And so we see Samuel come in as a young child and be given to Eli to raise. And ultimately, Eli's sons won't be the next judge. Samuel is. We're at the same spot. The sons haven't got it. They haven't followed in the ways of the Lord. The men of Israel, I think rightfully so, are saying, we have a problem. We don't need Joel. We don't need Abijah. We don't need them. They don't walk in your ways. So all the elders of Israel gathered together. 
they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, You are old. Your sons don't walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. He said, Listen, or the Lord told him, He said, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you that they have rejected. But they have rejected me as their king, as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me, serving other gods. So they are doing to you now. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king will do that reigns over them. It's interesting to me, children of Israel all of a sudden had to make a choice. They didn't like what they saw coming. They could continue to trust God or they could ask for a king. They could, the king is the cash, by the way. It was something they could see, it was something they could know. They knew what it looked like. They thought they wanted it. But the reality is, All the way through Samuel, there's the talk of the kingship coming, but it was how it was going to be. Because the reality is the person who was leading Israel wasn't Samuel. It was God. What were they going to choose? The first thing I want to tell you is that you must trust is always about knowing the players. Trust is always about knowing who your players are. I coached soccer all the way up to the high school level. One of the things I got to learn to do is I always wanted to know what my players could do. When you're trying to get them in shape and you're trying to watch how they touch the ball with their feet and how they would get their self in position, I wanted to know what they would do well. I knew down the center of In my soccer, right down the center of the field, I wanted somebody who could put the ball at the back of the net, a striker. I wanted a midfielder who could control a team, who could control the ball. He could be aggressive when he needed to. He could come back and help his defense when he needed to. And he could give the ball out to the the guys on the side. Then I, I wanted two guys in the back in front of my goalie that I knew would sacrifice and do exactly what it took. They were going to be in front of that. They were going to attack. Then I wanted a goalie who was smart and loud and hard with good hands. I wanted to know what those players could do. My son, J.C.'s here, and he could tell you, when I said, protect my goalie, those words echo between his two ears. Yeah, don't they? (laughs) But I wanted to know what my players could do. The reality is, the Israelites, they weren't the coach. They weren't trying to ask to be what they could do well. But we always need to know who our players are. Because we start to trust them. When I made a call to switch to a defense or to do something different, I knew what my players could do. I trusted they could carry it out. The interesting thing is, the Israelites couldn't remember what God did right before. 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Ark of the Covenant has been away from Israel. It is the thing that they carried into battle to lead them and protect them. The Philistines had had it. And it says when they had it, they were blessed. The very beginning of 1 Samuel 7, it's returned to them. And the children of Israel realize that God has blessed them with it, and they come back to celebrate and gather as one community. And when the Philistines heard this, they surround them right where they are. It says while the celebration was going on that the Philistines drew near. They were right there. They were prepared to attack. 
They could smell the food cooking. They could smell whether they had had a shower or not. Probably not. They were about to pounce on the Philistines and to smash them. Or the Israelites, the Philistines were. Then all of a sudden, God thunders against them and delivers the Israelites. The Israelites couldn't remember to trust God because he had delivered them over and over and over. It says in 1 Samuel 7, it says that God thundered against the Philistines. Samuel told the Israelites to pursue them. And they destroyed the Philistines all along the road. Trusting is about knowing who you're trusting. They had seen God deliver them out of Egypt. They had seen God walk with them through the desert. They had seen God deliver them over and over and over throughout the judges. But yet they couldn't think to trust him. They couldn't trust him just because they didn't like to see Joel and his brother. What are the things you're afraid to trust God with today? What are the things... That you're not allowing God to be God. Because the idea for me on this trusting is about knowing your players. It's about knowing where you are and who God is. If I got a seesaw, God's always where? It should be up here and I'm down here. How many times do we get that backwards? How many times do we get it opposite? We say, well, John, I'm a... I can make good decisions, and I think God gave us a brain and the ability to make lots of decisions. But I think sometimes we forget to ask God to lead us. That we forget to trust Him when the going gets tough. The Israelites faced a challenge, and they wanted to lean on their own understanding. They wanted to lean on their own ways. Graduates, y'all are going to have the next part of your life opening up. Are you going to follow Him? When sometimes you don't know what's in the box. Or are you going to take what the world is offering and challenging you? And saying, it's okay, go this way. It's the choice you're going to make. By the way, it's the choice your parents and grandparents have to continue to make it even today. It is. But the reality is, trust is about knowing your role. Trust is about knowing exactly who you are. Because if you get, Chris and I were talking about this week as we were pre- preparing to preach, It's really about knowing your identity and who you belong to and where you fit. When I was coaching soccer and J.C. was having to listen to me holler, there was no doubt I was the coach or I'm dad, and he was here. He had to listen to the bark. It's kind of odd as he's maturing. My role is a lot vaguer. But the reality is, just as it was with coach and player, it's the same thing with me and God. I should always remember to trust God. Because he's a little smarter, maybe a whole lot smarter than I am. But how many times do I want to do this? I think John is smart. John has had 49 and 7 eighths years worth of life experience. Y'all catch that? Okay. I'm holding on to that one eighth as long as I can. It's actually 11 twelfths, but we won't go there. The... Uh, I get, I get it backwards. The children of Israel got it backwards. They wanted to follow themselves as opposed to leading God. Samuel was like, they're rejecting me. And God says, they are not rejecting you, Samuel. I set you over them. It's not about you. It's about me. He said they've been doing it ever since we set them up loose out of Israel or out of Egypt. They have been literally a seesaw, back and forth, back and forth. Don't ever forget to know your role. I like basketball. I'm a product of the 80s. I got to see Michael Jordan at his best. Michael Jordan was amazing. You knew he was going to push off at Salt Lake, and hit the shot fading away. But you also knew there were role players who were going to come in like Steve Kerr and stand in the corner and wait for the big shot. 
Michael was going to get the glory, and you were going to get the ring. Don't ever forget to allow God to be God. And you to be the one who has received his grace that is following him. What is it you're not trusting God with today? What is it that you have not been willing to allow him to be king of? You're going, the world says it's about money. It's about having the biggest, the best. The world says it's not about having any pain or any struggles. I'm going to choose that. But yet God says, humble yourself and serve and follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me. The other thing is, every time I move that, I don't like moving it because it's heavy. I think about how heavy that is. Christ telling me to pick up my cross and follow him. He later says, my yoke is light and my burden is easy. But the only way that happens is when we trust him. The end of these verses, God tells Samuel, he goes, Samuel, let them have a king, but warn them about what is coming. Warn them what a king will require of them. And we're going to give them Samuel, David, and Solomon. He says, remind them that they're going to demand at least a tenth of everything they earn. They're going to demand that their sons become soldiers. They're going to demand that their daughters become maidservants and indebted to the king. Then they're going to ask because they don't have enough. They're going to ask for more. And then when you don't have any more money and stuff to give them, they're going to demand you. And they did. So much so that Israel literally, after Solomon bust wide open, we have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And they can't, they can't get a good king for anything. It's about four to five in one of the kingdoms. Bad king, or four bad kings to one good king. Even the good kingdom doesn't even get one good king and one bad king. Because as opposed to following God, they choose to follow the ways of the world. You go, John, I, you do not know what I'm in. I'm going through a divorce right now, and I'm done. But are you going to allow God to lead you through it? John, I'm out of work. I've got a job offer that says I can go somewhere up the East Coast and make a lot of money. But I think God is telling me to stay here. What are you going to do? Are you going to take the cash or are you going to take behind and follow God? Maybe you're sick. Somebody in your family is sick. It's a challenge. Are you willing to follow God? Face whatever he has? Or are you taking the cash and hitting the door? I'm going to follow the ways of the world. Jesus does not ever promise to, that your life will be easy. He does not promise that he is a genie in the box, that the box has the trip to Hawaii. But he always says, I will be with you. I will never forsake you. I will see you through the journey. I will walk with you through the valleys that are so dark you can't figure out where the end of it is. I will be there. What is it that you will choose today? Because I promise when you start trusting, the decisions get better. I'm not telling you they'll be easy. James says that you take those trials and understand that he is perfecting your faith so that you might be more like Christ today than you were yesterday. That in the midst of that heat and that trial, that while you're getting squeezed, he's still molding you. And I'll tell you, that moment is hard. That moment is challenging. But are you going to follow God and understand that and know that you're in the right spot? Or are you going to look for the first escape hatch and follow the ways of the world? Because 
The thing I want you to remember today, the thing I want you to understand is that when you see God for who he is, when you see God for the one who loved you enough to send Jesus to die for you, to provide you grace, you can trust him. But so often in this world, I had to pull these out earlier because my it was dark and I can't see great. My vanity doesn't want you to see these. When I can see God, when I can put on the glasses of his word and I can see, it is amazing I can actually see now. When I can see God for exactly who he is, he's the lover of my soul. He is the one who died that I might be free. When I don't lose sight of that, it is easy for me to choose the box that I can't see the end of the road to. When I can see God clearly for who he is, as opposed to getting my own relationship with him out of whack, not seeing him for who he is. When you start seeing God rightly, it makes it easier for you to trust him when it's challenging. What is it today that you haven't been trusting God with? What is it today, the decision that lays in front of you, that you haven't been willing to ask him about? What is the decision or the thing in your life that you're like, this is mine, I've got it, I know exactly what it is. God, I'm not ready for that. I'm right here, Lord, and I'm going to make that choice. And yet God's just knocking away, going, don't take the big job. Stay right where you are. By the way, I've watched that played out literally in the last few weeks by somebody that's a church member here. They've been offered the job. The cool thing is I watched them choose to stay here because they clearly told me God was telling them to stay. What is it that God is asking you to trust you, to trust him? To trust him when you can't see the other side. The Israelites couldn't. But when you see God for who he is, trust him to be your savior, it's a whole lot easier to follow him. My question for you this morning is, are you seeing God as your savior? Are you seeing the one that you trust enough to follow him wherever he leads? Or what is it that he needs, you need to give him today? Let me pray for you this morning. God, I pray that as we prepare to go out this week, that we might see you exactly as who you are, as our Savior, our Creator, the lover of our soul. You cared so much to send Jesus to pay a debt that we couldn't pay. Lord, may your Spirit speak to us that we might see you and trust you every day of our life. Thank you, Father, for your Son and for who you are. Amen. I ask you to stand as our acolyte comes, and I'll give you a blessing of dismissal today. I said it was going to be okay that we had... 45 seconds of silence, and now the kids get quiet. Oh, there we go. The challenge is you see this. I don't know, the, between the holiday and the rain, there's not a lot of folks here. Bring somebody back with you next week. Let Invite them to come and be a part of your house. Or check on your friend that sits near you that's not here today. As the light of Christ walks out, let me give you this blessing as we go forward. May you walk in the light of the cross. May you follow him through good days and bad. May you always see him as your Lord and Savior. And may you be salt and light in a world that runs in darkness. And may you thank the Heavenly Father for Jesus Christ always. Amen. You are dismissed.
were gone I'd work for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife Thank my lucky stars to be living